All right, so let's look at chapter 20, uh, which deals, the second chapter dealing with the cardiovascular system, and this one deals with the heart. So let's look at, at heart anatomy. So our heart is found in our thoracic cavity, just off to the left side a little bit. All right, and your heart is roughly about the size of your fist. So first thing we're gonna look at is uh, membranes around the heart. So this is collectively known as the pericardium. So the pericardium is the covering of the heart. So these things around the heart there. So the first is the fibrous pericardium. So that's this um, outer layer right there is the fibrous pericardium. So this is a loose fitting sac around the heart and it's made of dense fibrous connective tissue covering. Or, uh, covering. So anyway, so one of the things it does is it protects the heart. Anytime you have a tough fibrous connective tissue covering around an organ, it's gonna protect uh, it from um, microorganisms getting to it. So pathogens there. It also anchors the heart to the surrounding tissues and it prevents the overfilling of the heart. So it's non-elastic. So if the heart expands to that fibrous pericardium, it can't expand more. That's how it protects that heart from overfilling. Uh, inside of that, you're gonna see one layer here in blue and another layer there in red. And that is the serous pericardium. So this is serosa around the heart and there's two layers to it. You have the parietal pericardium, which is on the visceral, uh, on the uh, fibrous pericardium. And then you have the visceral pericardium, which is actually on the heart. Now, these two um, membranes are continuous with each other. So they double back and this creates this uh, space in between there. And that is known as a pericardial cavity. And that contains serous fluid. Now, if you remember that serous fluid is a lubricant. And so serous membrane produces that serous fluid. So when our heart is beating in our chest, it's that visceral layer is moving. It's a parietal layer. So that really reduces the friction in there. Okay, now let's take a look at the layers of the heart. So the outer layer uh, is the epicardium. Uh, this is also known as the visceral pericardium. It's the same thing, all right? Next is the uh, myocardium. That's a middle muscle layer of the heart. This is made of cardiac muscle tissue. And within that is a fibrous skeleton of the heart. So that's made of collagen, elastic fibers, and that's an anchoring point for those uh, uh, cardiac muscle cells. All right. Uh, lastly is the endocardium. That's the inner lining of the heart is the endocardium. So um, uh, this is made of endothelium, which is essentially simple squamous epithelium. Uh, and that is continuous with the arteries in the veins. So uh, this is just another picture of this. There's the epicardium, myocardium, there's the endocardium. So this is a front view of the heart. Now, whenever we look at uh, pictures that show blood vessels in there, uh, what we need to look at with those blood vessels is that red indicates high oxygenation, blue indicates low oxygenation. All right, so, um, so this is the front view of the heart. Um, this is a back view of the heart. Uh, these are the upper chambers, those are the atria. These are the lower chambers, those are the ventricles. So if we go to the next picture here, let's go to this one here, because this one shows all the chambers of the heart. So the two upper chambers here and here, those are the atria, and these are chambers re that receive blood returning to the heart. And they are divided by a septum known as the interatrial septum. Now, when we are a fetus inside of our mom, there's a little hole there called the fa uh, foramenal valley, right? And that hole is gonna close up uh, you know, a couple months after we're born, and that leads to this little area known as the fossa ovalis, a remnant of that. These guys are thin-walled chambers, uh, and they're thin-walled chambers because they only have to push blood down into the ventricles. So you don't need a whole lot of strength to do that. Those ventricles are right there. Now, the right atrium receives blood uh, returning from the body, and it's going to push that blood into the right ventricle. The left atrium receives blood returning from the lungs, so that blood is, gets oxygenated, and that's why it indicates the red color. All right, uh, and that's gonna push blood down into the left ventricle. I should point out, um, I'll probably say this again, but blue indicates low oxygenation, red indicates high oxygenation, not the actual color of the blood. Okay, so down here are the two ventricles. Uh, the ventricles, these are chambers that force blood out of the heart. Uh, they are divided by the interventricular septum right there. All right, so uh, the right ventricle here is gonna pump blood uh, to the lungs. 
and the left ventricle here is going to pump blood out to the body so to the top of your head down to your toes and, and fingers all right so if you notice here the left ventricular walls are thicker than the right and that's because the left has to do more work the right ventricle is pumping blood to the lungs which are right next to the heart that left ventricle has to pump blood you know especially uh, when we're standing up against gravity to the top of your head all right now let's look at blood vessels associated with the heart so we're going to come back to this picture here so over here these are showing the coronary arteries these are arteries that supply blood to the tissues of the heart if these are guys are blocked up that's going to lead to a myocardial infarction which is a heart attack so where have that blockages downstream from there the blood's not getting there those tissues begin to die uh, next are the cardiac veins over here are the cardiac veins these are veins that drain blood from the tissues of the heart all right let's go back to this picture here and let's look at these valves so the first two valves are these two here these are the semilunar valves so the first is the aortic semilunar valve so this is the aortic semilunar valve it is between the uh, left ventricle and the aorta all right now i do want to point out this uh, picture shows all the valves there, but that valve is typically a little further down. And I just love the way this has moved on me, and now it's not even going to want to go back. Come back. Thank you. All right, so that is actually right there, so it's not uh, up as high. That's all I was wanting to show there. I had to do all that. Anyway, next is the pulmonary valve, uh, pulmonary semilunar valve, there it is. It's between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk here, all right? And also, I'm telling you the flow of blood. Blood moves from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. Blood flows from the left ventricle into the aorta. All right, now let's take a look at those atrioventricular valves. So these two are the atrioventricular valves. On the right side is the tricuspid valve. So that is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. On the left side is the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. That's between the left, uh, left atrium and the left ventricle here. All right, so the only useful hint I can help tell you and try to remember this is tricuspid has an R in it. So that's on the right side. All right, both of these have uh, these stringy little things attached to them, which are called chordae tendineae. So these are collagen cords that attach to papillary muscles in the ventricular wall. So here are the papillary muscles, right there are papillary muscles. Those are in the ventricular walls. All right, so what's gonna happen here is this is trying to show this here. So this is when the ventricle is filled with blood and then when the ventricle contracts, so right, the ventricular walls are contracting because those papillary muscles are attached to those ventricular walls, they will contract and that's gonna pull on these chordae tendineae and that's going to help close those uh, atrioventricular valves. So and that's going to help prevent backflow into the atria and then divert blood uh, through those semilunar valves. All right, let's look at um, uh, heart contraction and blood movement. So looking at cardio, cardiac muscle fibers first here. All right, so in terms of their contraction, they're going to contract very similarly uh, to skeletal muscle fibers that we talked about uh last semester now what's different about these guys is they have these intercalated discs in them so uh so these structures here are the intercalated discs so intercalated discs are, are junctions between adjacent cardiac muscle cells they have desmosomes in there those are going to hold the cells together but more importantly have gap junctions now gap junctions if you remember these are going to allow cytoplasm to uh to move from adjacent cells between adjacent cells okay so if i get a picture here so this is showing an intercalated disc here here are those gap junctions so what that means then is that when we talk about what a nerve uh so uh what causes a muscle contraction if you guys remember let's just scroll back in time and picture yourself last semester chapter nine right in order for a muscle contraction to occur what's going to happen there is uh, you're going to have an action potential along the sarcolemma of the cell, the plasma membrane. So sodium diffuses in, potassium diffuses out. That gets that impulse to move across the sarcolemma, down the two tubules, uh, simulating uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. 
those calcium ions bind to troponin, change the troponin tropomyosin complex shape. That allows the myosin to grab onto the actin and pull on the actin. If you guys remember all that stuff, that's great. All right. All I want you to remember there is that the sodium diffuses in and the potassium diffuses out for our purposes there. We know all the rest of that stuff is going to fall, right? So if we have an action potential occurring on this cell, because those gap junctions mean this, they essentially are sharing cytoplasm, then that action potential will occur in the very next cell as well. All right? So then we get this action potential moving from one cell to another cell to another cell very, very quickly. Okay? It's very different from skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells are not connected by these gap junctions. Okay? So what this does is it forms what is known as a functional syncytium. This is a mass of merging cells that act as a single coordinated unit. So we have one in the walls of the atria. So if I stimulate the atria anywhere, the, both atria are gonna contract. And we have another functional syncytium in the walls of the ventricles. So if I stimulate the ventricles at any one point, they will all contract, all those cells will contract at the same time as well.